Hi, and welcome to this uh, unit from chapter uh, two, or I'm sorry, chapter three on the law of gravity. We'll be talking about sections one today, namely uh, the laws of uh, planetary motion as uh, Mr. Kepler has uh, discovered them. Uh, basically, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Tico Brahe, before I do that, let me go a little bit of history. I know the textbook talks about that, and this is just a brief, basically, discussion of that. So prior to Mr. Uh, Tycho Brahe, there was a Copernicus, and before Copernicus, there is uh, actually the work of Ptolemy and the people before him, the Greeks, and so on and so forth. Uh, the idea was, as we saw from the previous chapter, that all of the celestial objects, basically, they move in a, uh, in a uh, dome, and uh, those uh, objects, basically, they are in some sort of a circular path, and in order to explain, among other things, the retrograde motion of Mars, Mr. Ptolemy came up with this, uh, basically, uh, uh, circular motion inside another circular motion, another circular motion. Well, uh, the calendar became a little bit uh, offset after a while because that description was just an approximation and Mr. Copernicus of course was asked to basically uh, correct the calendar in other words to go back to the observations and see if we can shift the calendar so that Christmas falls on Christmas and basically uh, all the religious holidays fall in their proper place because they shifted by the time uh, from uh, uh, almost 2000 years they shifted from the last time they were computed. Well, Mr. Copernicus, after looking at that, he said, okay, the biggest problem that we probably have done was assume that the, uh, that the, uh, the Earth is at the center of the solar system, so there is no way, for example, for me to predict the position of the Sun if I'm going to assume that the Earth is actually the center of rotation, but it's the Sun is. And based on that, he was able to correct the calendar to some extent, but he did not really abandon the idea of the circular path. So that was something that was uh, adopted in the, by the Greeks and later on by everybody dying, saying that, hey, the circular path is the most per per perfect path and the heavens are perfect and the earth is not because of the human sins and so on and so forth. Therefore, uh, all of the objects in the celestial sphere must be moving in circles. Then uh, Mr. Tycho Brahe, uh, you can read about him, he's got some, uh, basically, uh, he came from an aristocracy and actually he was backed by the kingdom, uh, by the king then. And he had a lot of means and he built basically one of the most powerful, if not probably the most powerful ever uh, observatory, unaided observatory, because at that time there were no telescopes, to basically collect all kinds of data. He collected a lot of data until basically he luck, his luck ran out and the king passed away. So at the end, he had a lot of data, but he needed somebody with a little bit of math background to explain that data for him and come up with patterns. And he was kind of skeptical. So he hired Mr. Kepler, but he did not give him all of the data. By the time after he passed away, then Mr. Kepler had access to all of the data, and he spent a long time, decades actually, examining the data, and he came up with three laws. And the three laws of Mr. Kepler are the basically uh, the following. The first law, and I need you to pay attention to this one because it's critical in terms of the homework. I'm trying to keep this recording as short as possible, and I recommend, again, that you go and read more about this one. So, again, Mr. Kepler's basically laws are the following. But first of all, it is not true that the planets orbit any circular path. I mean, he adopted, of course, uh, Copernicus' view that the uh, Sun is the center of the solar system and the Earth is no longer the center of the solar system. But the first law is, so this is law number one, paths that the planets go when they go around the Sun are ellipses. So the paths are elliptical paths. To give you an idea what an ellipse looks like is, and I know that we have, an, uh, we have a whole homework on that is, Basically, this is how the ellipse is. It has two focal points where the sun sits in one of them, it doesn't matter which, and that the planet goes around in this elliptical path. The distance between each point on this path, I'm sorry, the distance between the path and to the two focal points, this distance is the same or throughout the entire ellipse. That's basically what the definition of the ellipse is. The circle turned out to be a special case of the ellipse no more in the case that 
this side, which is called the minor, uh, semi, the minor uh, axis, and this side, which is the major axis. This is half of that. That's a semi-major axis, and this is uh, the semi-minor axis. So this will be A in the homework, and this distance will be B. Half that only. This distance is B, and this distance is A. And the distance from the center of the ellipse to the uh, focal point is what we call C. Okay, so that should give you an idea of the of the notations that we have in there. The the eccentricity of the ellipse is also defined as basically being the ratio of c over a. So those are some of the things that we have, and I recommend that you do the homework to have a better understanding of how this thing says. The homework is a step by step basically guide on how to get all of these calculations. So basically, this is law number one. Law number two says that the planets as they move around the the sun basically they sweep equal areas in equal times so for example if it takes a week to go from this point to that point and it takes a week to go from here to here that area the shaded area both shaded areas are the same so that's law number two so law number two are equal areas in equal times okay so that's the second thing that he notes. Again, he's looking at a lot of data that Tico Brahi and uh, they, col uh, they collected. So he, that's how he was able to come up with the, this law. The third law, and it took him a little bit more time to come up with the third law. The third law basically said the following, that the time it takes for a planet to go from a starting point, it doesn't matter which point, you can take any point on the path. As it goes around and comes back, then this time, which is called the period, so the period squared, and this is the major axis, or the semi-major axis, A, are in this law. The, in such a way that the square of the period is a proportional. So this symbol means it's a proportional, not equal, but a proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis. These three laws, of course, he disco discovered them basically experimentally based on data and he was able to uh, to uh, to do all kinds of things with them i'd like to do example number 3.2 because it's critical for your homework so i'm going to open a new tab in here quickly do that and let me read for you uh, or at least open this thing in here what is it here example 3.2 basically from the book says using the uh, orbital periods and semi major axis of uh, venus and earth that are provided so we have both in this case for example we have the semi-major axis the uh, period of the uh, of venus it takes 0.26 years to go once around the sun for us it takes exactly one year and also its uh, semi-major axis is 0 0.27, 0 0.72 in other words the distance from it on average to the sun is less than the distance from the earth to the sun that's because Venus is an inner planet further closer to the sun than the Earth is. And it's almost three quarters basically the way from the distance to the sun. So knowing this information, let's check the third law. The third law, I remind you, we just looked at it. It says that P squared and A cubed, they are proportional to one another. Okay? It's easy. For the Earth, P is one year, one squared. And uh, for the Earth... The, uh, the distance is 1 AU because the distances were given to me in 1 astronomical units. For this kind of problems, please do not convert into kilometers. Leave this thing because 1 AU is 150 million kilometers and you'll be tempted to do a conversion. Do not have to do that. So 1 cubed. So 1 squared is 1 and 1 cubed is 1. So this is a 1 to 1 relationship. I want to check this same thing in here for the case of, the, uh, for the case of Venus to see if I get the same information or not. Let me see if I can get a little bit more screen. That's why I pushed that thing there a little bit. Okay. Venus, we know that A is 0.72 AU. So I'm going to cube this number and I'm going to find, let me pull my calculator in here, if I can find it. So I have 0 0.72, 0 
0.72 and I'm going to raise it to the power 3. That's how I do it on this calculator and you can use choose whatever calculator you like. So the number is 0 0.373. I'm going to keep three sig figs, okay? 0 0.737. So it's 0 0.73 or is it 0 0.373? I'm sorry, 0 0.373. Let me make sure I have the numbers correct. 0 0.373, that's correct, okay? There was only one 7. So, the year on Venus, uh, let me uh, read the prompt again to make sure I am doing, not copying something wrong in here. The year on Venus is 0.62. So I'm going to square that number, remember? So it's P squared. I should find the number that is not too far from this one in here. So in here, point, point 0.62, I'm going to square this number. So I'm going to raise it to the power 2. And this number is 0.384. 0.384. So it's not exactly 100% exactly correct, but that's basically a close enough approximation. 0.38 and 0.37 are very close from one another. If you're interested in how much difference there is between these two, you take this number, you subtract from it this number, and you divide by their averages, and you will see that this is a very, very small error. So basically, 0.384 minus 0.3. 7, 3. I'm just going to find this error. I mean, how big the difference is because we really have to find how big these two numbers are. I mean, I'm just saying that they are equal. Are they really equal? If I'm saying equal, with what kind of uh, confidence do I'm saying that? So 0.384 minus. You don't have to do this last step for the homework, by the way. Okay, I'm just showing you in here for the purpose of this argument in here to see with what confidence I am saying this. So the difference is 0 0.11. And then I'm going to divide it by their average. Their average is, again, I'm going to add these two numbers, 0 0.384. The reason why I have to divide by average, either one of them could be correct. So when we do experiments in, in lab, we usually, when we don't know for certain which number is the more accurate than the other, or which one is given to be true, then we're going to find the average. So the average is 0 0.387, 0 0.3785, I'm sorry. So since we're doing three sig figs, so I'm going to do a 3.79. So I'm going to divide the difference, which is 0 0.011, divided by 0 0.3. 379 and that gives me 0 0.290 which if I multiplied by uh, by basically uh, 100 is going to be 2.9 percent so I'm just going to do this last step in here just to show you guys how you do this uh, quickly on your calculator so I'm multiplying it by 100 and the answer is 2.9 percent so I know for a fact that these two numbers are identical within a 3 percent error okay 2.9% is less than actually 3%. So within a 3% error, these two numbers are accurate. So what we're saying in here is Kepler's law, the third law of Kepler, works for this case of Venus within a 3% accuracy. Actually, if we have better numbers, we're probably are going to get a much better answer to this one. I want to stop the recording in here, and then we'll continue the discussion.